Caesar marches through northern Italy towards Rome. Pompey and most of the Senate flee Rome and head to Greece. They take the war away from Italy. But in the same breath, Pompey has abandoned Rome to Caesar. And that's not going to look good. And of course, Caesar plays that to his advantage. He becomes the statesman. He does indeed. Let's go to that famous phrase, the die is cast. Uh, it is beautifully put. Um, did he say it? We have several sources, so Suetonius and two Greek historians, who attribute this phrase to Caesar. One Greek writer says that he actually says it in Greek. <laughs> so he's just you know, showing off you know, how educated he is by throwing out a quick quip. You know, it's like me saying something in French. And what about its meaning? It's I meaning. mean, now it yes. means to us, it's a done deal. Everything that follows now is written. 
Right, but there might also be the sense of, you know, the die is cast, you're, you're playing a, a, a gambling game. Uh, it's a game of risk, it's so a game of chance. You don't yet know what a game will of happen, dice. but you've thrown the dice. Exactly. And Caesar, we know from accounts of other periods in his life, is a high-stakes gambler. So this is a man who, in a sense, is used to brinkmanship. He's Definitely. really used to having incredible confidence in himself, mm -hmm. and when it comes to it, he's used to always going for the risky option. Exactly. And this is a moment when you know, he's got a whole legion behind him. He's standing on this little bridge over a river, and this is the time to show unswerving confidence in the next step you're going to take. And so Caesar, a man clearly made for brinkmanship, burns himself into the pages of history. Though like all such moments, his victory will have repercussions, and his overreaching ambition will lead soon to his own assassination. But then he knew that. His myth, though, will live on, both as a brilliant general and, as Shakespeare would have it, the consummate risk-taker. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never tasted death but once. That brinkmanship moment between Caesar and Pompey is a classic one, threats made real by the muscle of armies. But there are players in history whose struggle is not about territorial power. Men whose weapons are spiritual, who believe they have God on their side. And when a man believes that, no line in the sand can hold him back. Italy on the cusp of the 15th century. We're heading back towards that city square and the rain-soaked timbers. The players here are Girolamo Savonarola, the upstart preacher, versus Pope Alexander VI, otherwise known as Rodrigo Borgia, not someone you take on lightly. Rome is now the centre of the Catholic Church, immensely rich and by anyone's standards immensely corrupt. Savonarola is a man of intense piety who comes to fame in Florence. His platform is the pulpit, and his message is reform. In Rome, there remains no charity at all, but only the devil. He's throwing down a direct gauntlet to Rome and the Pope, a man with a very different kind of charisma. Clever, even ruthless, Rodrigo Borgia is a church politician rather than a spiritual leader. He has mistresses and children, and while he's fond of the Virgin Mary, he is not a man at ease on his knees. And Savonarola knows that. When God permits the heads of the church to overflow with wickedness, when ambition, lechery and vice is to be found there, then believe me, the scourge of the people draws near. Believe me because it is not I, but God, who says these things. With the temperature rising, the Pope calls Savonarola to Rome, but this preacher answers to no one but God. Savonarola refuses, uh, fearing a trap, and uh, claiming that the Pope has been misinformed about this preaching. Do people turn down the Pope very often? Not really. <laughs> Stefano Bellaglio, Renaissance historian from the University of Edinburgh, has been living with Savonarola for much of his academic life. So, well, of course, this is going to have serious consequences. And it's no surprise that uh, uh, less than two years later, Savonarola ends up being excommunicated. So this is a serious spiritual weapon, right, excommunication. What does it mean? It, it actually means uh, putting uh, person completely outside of the Christian community, cut out of every aspect of political, social and private life. So what happens? Does Savonarola stop preaching? What, what does he do? Actually, Savonarola uh, went on preaching after the first moment uh, he didn't want to comply because he saw preaching as his life. And of course the level of conflict with Alexander got higher and higher. What about his followers, right? I mean, they're good Christians. Does it make them waver at all? Absolutely, yes. Uh, they were forced to a radical choice between uh, loyalty to, the, to Savonarola and obedience to the Pope. And only the staunchest followers of Savonarola remained on the side. So what happens next? 
the final blow to Savonarola's reputation was represented by the threat of interdict. What's the interdict? <laughs> the interdict uh, is an ecclesiastical sanction which applies the suspension of every religious practice. And in late medieval Italy, a contest in which religion invades every aspect of social, public, and private life is actually meant a paralysis of an entire city. He excommunicates the whole of Florence. Yeah, that's it. Uh, an entire state uh, where the dead cannot be buried, no masses, uh, no baptisms, and so on. It, it really does feel like the equivalent of a set of UN sanctions which really, really does hit every element of life and isn't just a problem for the leaders, but is a problem for the whole country. Absolutely. The threat of them to death uh, brought the foreign history. We've reached the brook, that moment in the city square where I left you at the beginning, the ordeal by fire to show whose side God is on and the downpour which washes it out. At that point, uh, a sign from God was the only way for Savonarola to regain consensus. And Florentine people uh, was not willing to, to wait anymore. Savonarola was arrested, tortured during the, the trials, admitting that he was a prophet, that he had pretended being a prophet just for political reasons and for his personal glory. It must have been appalling for the followers to have been so convinced that they were led by somebody who had been spoken to by God and for them to confess that it happened. That was the terrible blow and uh, most of them completely abandoned, not just the Bonarola, but just uh, all the ideas of political, moral, social reforms that Savonarola had promoted. I don't know about you, but I find that end quite upsetting. The Savonarola really a consummate fraud for someone who truly believed until the agony of torture changed his mind. Either way, he was clearly his own worst enemy. A man who wouldn't, who couldn't negotiate. And so he signed his own death warrant. On the 23rd of May, 1498, he was burnt at the stake in that same city square. Yet that's not quite the end of the story. Because even after his ashes were thrown into the rivers and nothing would be left of a relic, his reforming voice and his passionate condemnation of the church lived on. And 20 years later, another equally pugnacious monk, this time called Martin Luther, took on another pope. And so began the Protestant Reformation. What we've been talking about so far is individual leaders who go to the brink. But what about the experience of ordinary people who, for large swathes of history, believed that they were living on another kind of brink, the final great test when the earth itself would be destroyed, consumed by flood, fire, famine and pestilence, when God would come again to judge the living and the dead? Constantinople, present-day Istanbul, in the 6th century. A city which has become almost acclimatized to living on the edge. James Palmer, an early medieval historian at the University of St Andrews, is surprisingly upbeat for someone who spends his life studying belief in the end of the world. The Christian apocalyptic tradition very much ties to the, the word of Christ himself. In the Gospels, he prophecies that the, the end times will come soon. He outlines signs, people rising against people, flooding, persecutions. So every which way, people are living under the threat of reasonably imminent apocalyptic demise. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy living in the modern world as it is in the medieval and in the ancient world. And what the apocalyptic traditions promise, uh, it promises a release. After one final suffering, we will be brought in, we will be judged, and those of us who have lived a good life, we get an eternity of salvation and peace, and that's incredibly attractive for people. Presumably not everyone's wandering around thinking, bring it on, because I've been good. Isn't there a level of incredible anxiety also going on? 
and that is probably one of the defining productive tension points. Where the apocalypse really gets a lot of its um, power is this sense that time is running short and preparing yourself to deal with that. So now let's look at the moments when time really looks like it's running dangerously short. What, what happens to make them even more worried? It's quite clear that one does not predict when the end of the world will come, but there are signs, things like natural disasters and political turmoil. At the beginning of the 6th century, you get a mini ice age triggered by a volcanic eruption in 536. You get an outbreak of bubonic plague. Literally thousands of people dying in Constantinople every day. You can smell the dead in the streets. And that is the kind of very intense environment in which people are going to think, this is unusual. Is time actually running short? So we're talking about this 20 years when a lot of stuff happens, but it feels like there's also a longer drum march of tension going on, which is about the devastation of war. In the beginning of the 7th century, when you get the Arab groups uniting, you get the spread of Islam, you get the Prophet Muhammad, and then you've got swift conquests over the next 10 years, and suddenly, from out of nowhere by 717, 718, there are Arab Muslim conquerors outside the walls of Constantinople. And where did this come from? This, this is a huge shock. And it's natural that apocalyptic anxieties become part of the way that people deal with that change. That's a long time for a population to live with the end of the world. But people do live with it, right? Because it doesn't happen. The way that it is often described, the Venerable Bede, the famous historian of the English, but he says that if you expect the end of the world tomorrow and it doesn't come, you'll be disappointed. If you expect it further in time and it comes sooner, you'll be disappointed. The only way you can do this is to live in a perpetual state of watchfulness. And that's what a lot of people do. Um, and it doesn't mean that that dominates every waking moment of their lives. I th think we all live in times when we, we can be very anxious about the world around us. We're living through one of them. We are definitely living through one of them. And you can wake up in the morning and worry about what's going to happen next, but then you're hungry and you want your breakfast, and you maybe don't think about those things. And a, a lot of people work through their anxiety just by doing things. It causes people to write books, make artwork, go and work in their field. The idea of apocalypse is rarely that one should sit back and just wallow in pessimism. What are you going to do about it? It's an interesting thought, isn't it, that humans almost need the idea of an apocalypse because the fear it generates can be a force for action. And when you think about it, recent history bears that out. The terror of nuclear war spawned a worldwide movement for disarmament. Even if we didn't die in the first blast, the balance of the planet would be so destroyed that nuclear winter would engulf us all. It's fascinating now to think about how that image of nuclear winter moved almost effortlessly into a different anxiety. But even without nuclear weapons, we were destroying the Earth through carbon emissions and global warming. And that, in turn, spurred huge numbers of people into passionate action, both personal and political. Maybe living with fear can be a force for good, as well as anxiety. Though I doubt many of us were ready for the recent backflip into nuclear paranoia. So just how worried should we allow ourselves to be at this present moment of tension between the United States and North Korea? I ask that of Lawrence Friedman. It's a continuation of a problem that's been with us for some time. Every time an American president wants to solve it, it becomes clear there isn't an obvious solution, but equally they can live with a non-solution. And I think that that is why it's perhaps not as dangerous as initially portrayed. The dangers, I think, come possibly from the personalities involved and possibly chance events suddenly intervenes and you, you, you're in a much more difficult situation than you envisage. But in terms of the actual structure of the US-North Korean confrontation, I think it's manageable. What I've come to realise through this programme is that there will always be games of brinkmanship and that the apparatus of negotiation has to continue underneath the bombast. But what really seems to count is the quality of the players. And with that in mind, I want to leave the last word to someone who witnessed firsthand the workings of power 
during a moment of intense brinkmanship. Dear Mr. Chairman President, I would like to thank you for sending Mr. McCoyan as your representative to my husband's funeral. He looked so upset when he came through the line. I was very moved. Just days after John F. Kennedy's funeral in Washington in November 1963, his wife Jackie wrote a letter to the Russian leader, Khrushchev. How apt her words sound today. The danger which troubled my husband was that war might be started not so much by the big men as by the little ones. Well, big men know the needs for self-control and restraint. Little men are sometimes moved more by fear and pride. If only in the future big men can continue to make little ones sit down and talk before they start to fight. Lydia Leonard reading the words of Jackie Kennedy. Other readings were by James Quinn. When Greeks Flew Kites is presented by Sarah Dunant and the producer is Catherine Godfrey. It's a Whistle Down production for BBC Radio 4. And you can find out more about this episode on the programme's pages of the BBC Radio 4 website where you can also subscribe to the podcast. When Greeks Flew Kites returns next month. Now, it's not a bank holiday weekend everywhere across the country, but for those of you who are off tomorrow, why not join Jane Garvey tomorrow morning at 10? Bucket and Spade is not compulsory, by the way. Bank Holiday Monday's edition of Women's Hour is in Margate, with the broadcaster Gemma Kearney, former Apprentice winner Michelle Dubry, and tech presenter Gia Milinovic. They're in Margate helping women feel better about their bodies by inventing a product or an activity that might help. Uh, swimsuits, mirrors, shouting and life drawing classes, all in the mix. Women's Hour in Margate on Bank Holiday Monday morning just after 10. BBC News at two o'clock. Two lorry drivers have been charged over yesterday's crash on the M1 motorway, which left eight people dead and four others with serious injuries. Richard Mazeriak, who's 31, and 53-year-old David Wagstaff are accused of causing death by dangerous driving. A second man has been arrested in connection with the suspected terrorist incident at Buckingham Palace on Friday night. The 30-year-old man was detained in West London. A 26-year-old man, accused of driving a car at police officers outside the palace, was detained at the scene. For the first time, Labour has committed to keeping the UK in the EU single market and customs union during a transition period after Brexit. This would mean accepting the free movement of people and continuing to contribute to the EU budget beyond 2019. The Labour MP... Chuka Amuna is the co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on EU relations. It makes sense and it brings the Labour Party's position in line with that of the TUC, that brings the party into line with what the CBI has been saying to many people in civic society. But the key, now that we've had this change in policy with regards to what happens in that short period after we leave the European Union, the transition period, is to ensure that we're arguing for this at the end of that transition period is a permanent solution. Thousands of people have fled their homes following two days of violence in the state of Rakhine in Myanmar. Members of the Muslim Rohingya minority have escaped to the border with Bangladesh, where border guards are turning them back. Non-Muslim villages have been evacuated. The fighting began when Rohingya insurgents attacked 30 police stations on Friday. The American filmmaker Toby Hooper has died at the age of 74. He was best known for the horror films Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist. His final film as producer, Leatherface, received its world premiere this weekend at the Frightfest Film Festival in London. The festival's director is Alan Jones. He was one of the most influential filmmakers of all time. I mean, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was not only a masterpiece of horror, but it was also one of the films that was a landmark because of the way it was shot in a very sort of documentary style. Many people think, of course, that it was actually this ghoul fest. It actually wasn't. Nevertheless, it influenced a whole generation to carry on. A German woman has died of injuries she suffered in the van attack in Barcelona 10 days ago. 
Her death brings to 16 the number of people killed by Islamist militants in the city and the nearby town of Cambrils. BBC News. Master Tapes returns with a celebrated singer, songwriter and composer. Six Grammys, three Emmys, two Academy Awards, Oscar nominated in fact 20 times. Yeah, lost 17, 18 straight times. <laughs> Randy Newman tells John Wilson about his classic album, Sail Away, and how it fits in with the rest of his hugely successful career. It's often said that Randy Newman is an artist who makes you laugh and cry, so you prefer to make people laugh. Well, it depends. If I'm getting paid to do Toy Story, I'll make them cry. <laughs> Master Tapes with Randy Newman. Tomorrow morning at 9 on BBC Radio 4. And there are some other good things to listen out for tomorrow. Jenny Eclair is doing a programme about lists and why women in particular enjoy making them. You can hear that at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. And then later in the day at 8, the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown celebrates three amazing structures that span the Firth of Forth. From Scotland to South Wales now, where we join the chairman Eric Robson and his panel for Gardener's Question Time. This week we find us in the green city of Cardiff. I'm in the Grade 1 listed historic landscape that's Butte Park, a 56 hectare pleasure ground in the heart of the city. The park, essentially the grounds of Cardiff Castle, boasts more than 2,000 trees, including some champions known to be the biggest examples of their species anywhere in the UK. It's also a spectacular haven for wildlife. Uh, visitors can see all three species of woodpecker, tree creepers, otters, leaping salmon and herons amongst other things. Over the centuries, the changing gardening fashions that have shaped the castle's grounds have been a constant inspiration for the city's army of gardeners, some of whom have joined us in the Gate Theatre to welcome Matthew Wilson, Bunny Guinness and Matt Biggs, already on stage as your fashionable and champion Gardener's Question Time panel. Coming up later in the programme, Matt Biggs goes all theatrical on us when he goes in search of the gardening bard. But before that, who's got our first question, please? Good afternoon, panel. My name is Sue Black and I'm from Swansea. I have successfully used one of my sheep species under my run beans this year and I've hardly watered at all. Is there anything else that I can use it for in my garden? 101 uses for a sheep's fleece, by the goodness. So is this skin? Is this from a dead sheep or is this the No, wool? they're all still... <laughs> <laughs> they are actually all still running around the field. Yeah, I do this as well because I, I have self-shearing sheep, but you can sort of pull them out in handfuls. And it's fabulous, isn't it? I then put it underneath my brassicas and everything and it really does help keep the slugs off. Well, I've got 18 and I've got about four years' worth because I haven't used it for ages. Oh, you could sell it to start with to those who might well, need I'm, it. I'm, I'm actually on an allotment in Gowerton in Swansea and I'm trying to persuade everybody that mine has been successful and they should all have it off me next year. I, I think that's <laughs> your best bet because I think, you know, you, I, I thought it's a bit silly to put it in the compost heap, isn't it? And I, I just chop mine up and I put it all over my beds, everywhere where I don't want slugs. This is amazing. This is real horticultural fleece. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, hang, hanging baskets, what about liners for hanging baskets? So what about in, uh, insulation for dahlias and plants like that in the, in the winter time? Uh, so just as a, as a protective layer, surely mm -hmm. you could lay that over the top with still the air movement. And I think anywhere where you need insulation, just put that in there, put it in. But it, it's a great in soil improver for, for thin, fast draining soils. And you mentioned at the start that you had, had needed to water your so no. runner beans? Yeah, my runner beans. It, but uh, it was a little bit too successful because they grew so well that the wind did actually blow some of them down. <laughs> right. So next uh, year uh, I need new sticks. <laughs> I, I've seen it used very effectively as a weed suppressant though. In a, a lovely garden, uh, John Ruskin's garden on the shores of Collison in the Lake District. They ran an experiment uh, and it worked really, really well. Right, thank you very much. And you could always knit and put, make handsome little jackets for your tender winter plants. You know, one, of, one of the great things you could do is actually put it around the base of your shrubs and then there'd be no bleating about the bush. <laughs> Don't encourage him. Well, thank you very much for all of that. You're most welcome. Thank you for your question. Yes, Lydia. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Bagstaff from Landrick Major. 
Um, this year I've tried growing a chilli variety called Friar's Hat for the first time. The instructions on the packet say that it's a good variety to overwinter, but I've never tried overwintering a chilli before. Do you have any suggestions? Have you overwintered chilies, Matt? With moderate success, I have to say, because um, the usual thing is that if you start from uh, seed each year, you get a, a young, vigorous plant. But if you're going to overwinter them, it's just a matter really of cutting the, the laterals back by about a third uh, and then keeping it in a, in a cool, bright place with a little, a little water to keep it alive. So you're effectively putting it into a state of suspended animation. One of the advantages is that they then break into growth early in the spring. So you're likely to get them flowering and get better growth from them. But overall, it's an interesting experiment I felt, but overall, it, to me, it's much better to start from new each year. But if you grow them like that, they can end up lasting for, for several years. I, I, I like to keep them on the windowsill in the kitchen when they're finished doing their stuff in the greenhouse because I just think they look fabulous. I don't cut them back, but those ones that haven't ripened or they'll carry on flowering and producing through the winter, I find, in, in our, our kitchen's quite warm probably. Um, so they look wonderful, we've got fresh chillies, and then I usually sow some more the next year because I think they get they sort of run out of steam a bit, but maybe I'm not such a good gardener as Matt who keeps them going for several years, I don't no. I'm growing a new one this year, a patron, which is really nice. It's the tapas chili. And what I love about it is, is they're quite mild if you, pick, if you cut them when they're green and then they get hotter and hotter and hotter. And so you can pick them at the stage that you want rather than having to grow different varieties. Well, and the beauty of those, of course, when you, when you have them in, uh, you know, in a tapas bar in, in uh, Madrid, you basically play patron roulette because you never know which one is going to be really, really hot. They're normally all quite mild and sweet and then you get one blows your head off. But I was just going to say, I'm thinking back to our visit to West Dean and the Chili Festival at West Dean last year, the advice from uh, Jim and Sarah, yes you can overwinter, but in many respects it's better to start afresh each year. I think if you kept, you probably could if you kept them really spot on, but how many of us do that? They tend to get red spider if it's inside because it's dry, so towards sort of February, March, they look slightly manked in my case. I, I think it's sort of file under the similar advice as pelagoniums. can be overwintered, absolutely, but actually better starting the following year. Oh no, I disagree totally with pelagoniums, but that's another story. <laughs> Anyway, the choice is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. One word upwards. Good afternoon, Lottie Edgerton from Barry. Uh, my other half and I picked up our key for an allotment last Wednesday, and my question to the panel is what are your top three must do's for uh, beginning allotment tiers? What sort of state is the allotment in? There's no sheds or greenhouse, and it's covered in bindweed. <laughs> oh, John. <laughs> <laughs> What are the top three things, Bella Guinness? I think unless you get rid of the bindweed, it's going to be just so disappointing because you're going to be fighting it all the way. So that would be my number one tip. And then number two, I think I would get um, a load of local authority green waste and I'd club together with a load of others because the more you buy, the cheaper it is per cubic metre. And then I would consider making raised beds or fixed beds, even if not raised, so that you're not actually standing on the soil when you're working it. So each fixed bed would be at 1.2 metres wide by about 3 metres long. And if you never stand on it and compact the soil because you're quite wet here, you will find you'll get one wonderful structure soil and that is the most satisfying way to grow veg. And what would you do, Matthew? Three tips, uh, bindweed. Cover with a thick layer of cardboard, cover the thick layer of cardboard with a thick layer of organic matter and go on holiday for a year. <laughs> <laughs> and when you come back you'll just have a bindweed free delicious soil that you can grow anything in. It lives longer than 12 months, Matthew. You've got to go away for about five years, I reckon. <laughs> it really is five down years. there, and you could, you could five years, and it would still come back. It is so pernicious. I've got a lot of bindweed in my garden, and I've just, I've kind of had to learn to live with it. And I, I you know, I because I don't like to use chemicals, I, I, all I've got really that I can do is, is just keep, you know, yanking it out. And I, I'm slowly winning the war of attrition uh, against the bindweed. Um, and of course, the, the trouble when you're when you've got an allotment is the moment you start digging, you're essentially propagating it because you're splitting up the roots.
plants and they produce more plants. But you can you can win it over. And listen, a five year holiday, that's not bad. <laughs> but, but Matt Biggs, once you've got rid of the bindweed, what are the other things you need to do to prepare yourself for a, a career in allotment theory? I think um, do what Matthew says and remember number one that things will get better. Okay, so you're starting off in a very difficult spot but things will get better and if you actually put uh, a layer of well rotted organic matter um, above uh, the the solid layer the cardboard that um, is at the base then you can sow shallow rooted crops into that and then over time as the um, cardboard below rots away and the bindweed disappears you will have actually been cropping that area already remember also number two to sow as you clear The reason why you have an allotment is to get that, that lovely vegetables, you know, the freshness, the flavour, the pleasure of working out uh, out there. But just keep sowing. And I think the uh, lesson number three is that overall is that you are more persistent than any of the weeds that uh, come your way so yeah. as they as they appear go in there and it's much easier i think what we tend to do is to clear through an area and then go oh that's you know that's fine for a bit and then it gets bad again and another very useful tip if it's a, an allotment site with a number of allotments on it go around and look over the shoulder of the old timers who are already doing it and find out what's growing well for them because if it's growing well on their allotment, it's probably growing well on yours too. Thank you. You're most welcome. Later, thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Diane Dyson. I'm from Tuffswell. Uh, my question is, I live on the riverbank of the River Taff. I've controlled the Japanese knotweed just about, but not the Himalayan balsam yet. So looking up from the riverbank, you can see the structure of the path uh, down to the river, including a bath. Um, what can I grow in particular in spring and summer when the riverbank is quite bare to make this ice all pretty? I'd like something to tumble over that breeze block structure that you can see. We'll get some advice for you, but just before Thank we you. do, Lottie, just think how lucky you are. You just got, <laughs> you just got bindweed. Oh, there is some knotweed as well. Oh. <laughs> Matthew. Yes, Himalayan balsam is a pest and a pain, and of course it's, it's so prolific um, along some waterways in, in Britain. And of course it spreads actually in a rather remarkable way, it has explosive seed pods. So when you touch them when they're ripe, they detonate and that scatters the seed over a, a great distance. I suspect you're going to be battling Himalayan balsam forever, because whatever you do on your plot isn't going to stop it from establishing further up, upstream and the seeds coming down to you. So it's always going to be a battle. So with that in mind, I would tend towards things that are going to be tough, that are going to scramble, that are going to move around, you know, they're going to extend by rhizomes and they're, or they, and they're going to run. So the kind of things that you might not necessarily want to have in a more ornamental part of the garden, because they are going to do all of those things, you know, it's going to be a bit sort of out of control. Actually, you want that. So. You could go for things that I, I'd never recommend in a, in a garden, like saponaria, the soapwort, which runs like the clappers, um, but actually would do very well there. Some of the astromerias, again, they run like crazy and will fill quite big spaces, but of course have beautiful, um, in the case of the one that's really spreading, orange flowers. And even some of the, the, the kind of more ordinary plants, like vinca minor, you know, the ground covering plant, which is evergreen, I think would work really well there. Couldn't you use some of the more beautiful plants, the rambling rector, for example? Well, first that, of all, that, that would strangle. I mean, I thought of the hummus because that's sort of a little bit more natural and not too artificial. So I just cool. think it's something more natural for the river. Yeah, I agree. I think Eric's view is a little bit um, ornate for the situation. But some of the more natural roses. <laughs> it's the first time you've ever yes. been described as ornate. <laughs> Is it something to do with my age? <laughs> <laughs> well, you do carry it off rather well, sir. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I would think some, 
I mean, even dog noises or, or um, um, the, the ghost of those, I think we've trained up those, really, up those walls and would look quite nice. And some of the honeysuckles, Talmanian has got a lovely orange flower. And I did wonder about the head of the ivy. And there's a cristata, which has a very rumpled, chemical, pinky leaf green. And so it's, it's a bit ornate, but it's not too in your face ornate. And if you keep cutting that back, Annually, so you get a nice flat screen bed, smooth, and not lots of wands waving around. It does look pretty good. Great garden, wonderful view over the river. It must be absolutely stunning. Yeah, it is. I think I'd uh, go along those lines, but also add in some of the salix, and the, the, the coloured stem salix, and the dog so it's got interest to later in the year. But one thing I would do, do you know, I'd leave that bath there because one day. <laughs> is going to be so fantastic. You'll be able to go down there with a glass of champagne, sit in the bar and enjoy the view. Hot <laughs> tub. I thought hot tub actually was. <laughs> there we are, lots of suggestions. Thank you very much. Just to remind you, of course, the details of all the plants you mentioned, the plants can be found on the garden, especially in the garden of the area of the website. Now then, the life of William Shakespeare is an age-old mystery. And historians will no doubt continue to question the bard's true identity for years to come. But one thing's for certain, the plays and poetry reveal a writer who is just as comfortable turning the compost heap as he was turning a pithy phrase or two. So Matt Biggs went to meet writer Gerrit Quayley to explore how everything in Shakespeare's green fingers can be found on the page as well as in the garden. I'm sitting in a herb garden in East London behind the Geoffrey Museum. And in front of me, there is a mass of herbs. The fragrance is absolutely gorgeous. And with me is Garrett Quayley, who's written a book called Botanical Shakespeare. What was the garden scene like at the time when he was writing? Well, it, it had been on the rise since the 1560s and 1570s because Queen Elizabeth had come to the throne in 1558, and she was all about her. People were trying to impress her with their amount of learning because she was schooled really well. But part of that was uh, pleasure gardens started to happen. And one of the reasons is because Queen Elizabeth went on progresses all the time. And so people really had to spruce up, well, pun there, but anyway, spruce up their homes and their gardens. Let's just explain what a progress is. Oh, um, she, <laughs> she got asked for horses and people and trunks and, and carriages and just went on tour. What sort of gardens do you think Shakespeare would have seen as he, as he travelled around? One of the books that I love so much is how cowslips are like her tall pensioners, he says. And, and that's for Titania, so a cowslip, which is quite small, would be a tall pensioner to a tiny little fairy in Midsummer Night's Dream. But now when I went to the Chelsea Flower Show and saw the tall pensioners, I just saw these giant cowslips <laughs> bending over. <laughs> well, what other descriptions does he use? He, I mean, a lot of it is metaphor. Uh, and I say this about the rose, which is called Shakespeare's favorite flower, and it appears all over the place. It can be love, it can be beauty, it can be dynasty, it can be, he talks about the canker in the rose, showing how ugly things eat up something beautiful. Uh, he's got a great line in one of the sonnets where he says about lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. So beautiful things that have gone bad are actually uglier than the, 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 the common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. Yeah. Uh, we started off the book with the Winter's Tale quote because it's so, it talks about bringing art and nature together. Yet nature is made better by no mean but nature makes that mean. So, over that art, which you say adds to nature, is an art that nature makes. You see, sweet maid, we marry a gentler scion to the wildest stock, and make conceive a bark of baser kind, by bud of nobler race. This is an art which does mend nature, change it rather, but the art itself is nature. That, that is amazing, and that's talking about grafting and, and selection yes. of, of quality varieties. So, 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 I mean, again, to know about grafting, he must have known you know, a lot about plants. And his, 
there's a lot of reference to, to them. Just as shallow in Henry IV, part two says, we'll have a pippin of my own graphing. And this was pride. Look, I have an orchard. I've done this myself. Because there was a, a book about the, the art of, of planting and grafting trees that that went into five reprints. It was so popular. But of course, it ignited uh, the religious side, got very, very worried that this was against God's plan. But because from a garden history point of view, it gives us a glimpse as to what was being grown in gardens at the time. Yes. Well, they have garlic over here, I noticed. And the garlic, he, he tends to use the vegetables as butts of jokes all the time. But the garlic and onions, he talks about actors having sweet breath and don't eat any of that <laughs> stuff before, you, before you're going to be breathing on another person. You don't want your leading lady or leading man. Leading man in that case, to pass out <laughs> or to wince when they're supposed to be falling in love with you. A lot of these plants had such wonderful smells in the place that, you know, the houses didn't smell that good at the time, um, if you think about the lack of indoor plumbing and things. So they brought a lot of these fragrant herbs, even rosemary and, and to stomp along on their on the floors so that so that it released the fragrance. And that was a reason how the kitchen was well. Not so much if there was a fragrance. It was like emblematic and and practical. And the bachelor's buds or buttons they put on in the pelt. What do you reckon, Matthew? Um, when you say mock orange, because there's lots of different mock oranges, what, 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 can you give me the botanical name? No, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> is it a Philadelphus or is it something else? I have no idea. White flower, smelly? White, yes. Very fragrant. Mm. Philadelphus. Philadelphus, yeah. How, bi how big is it? About two foot high. Oh, okay. you'll be all right. As long as you... I mean, Philadelphus are quite fast-growing plants. I have a few of my... Philadelphus flower on the wood that is produced the previous season. So what you mustn't do is prune them just before they're due to flower due to or early in the year because you'll lose more flower bud. What you must do with them is if you are going to prune at all, although with your plant being young and small it's not going to be a problem for a while, prune it after the flower, absolutely essential. As long as you give it plenty of light, that's another thing. They mm. like they need they need decent light levels, good soil because all of that will help to ripen the, the wood for flowering. Uh, in a shadier location, it tends to do a less well. But yes, absolutely. I would say confidently you can see flowers in the next two years. Very well, you'll have successfully guaranteed. I'm Janet Richardson. I live in Rowe from back just around the corner from this building. This question is really for my husband. He's converted a small swimming pool, which we've emptied in the back garden, into uh, a sunken garden with some raised beds and a pond. Unfortunately, it has very little sunlight. In fact, it's, it's not just in shade, it's more like a cave at times. Uh, he wants to know what thoughts you might have or want to grow in it successfully and whether some form of artificial lighting, some advice on that, is possible. What sort of plants would, uh, would thrive in the dark, Matthew? <laughs> yes. Um, what, what, what was wrong with 
the swimming pool then? You just decided you didn't fancy swimming anymore. It's hard work swimming. Well, it sounds like the garden's going to be even tougher, doesn't it? In the, in not, my, not my problem. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, I was just, what sprung to mind immediately, actually, was, was something inspired by the Victorian ferneries. Because, of course, the ferns are, are, are one group of plants that will definitely tolerate those kinds of conditions and won't survive in reflecting light almost. Um, and you could grow a whole range of interesting ferns, and if you've got a pond, you can also grow ferns in the pond, but as my regardless, the regal fern, which is a, is a wonderful structural plant, the tropical fern, Tucci struthiopteris, the painted lady fern, um, the Japanese painted lady fern, Aethrium japonicum pinctum, uh, which is a lovely sort of black and silvery fern. There's a whole range of I mean, you could go nuts on ferns in there. And the great thing about ferns is that, unlike hostas, they don't get beaten by slugs and snails, which I suspect is going to be a problem in your troglodyte's cave. Is this troglodyte's cave? I can't quite see why it's so dark. It's just that there's, there's walls all around it, but there's no overhead shadow. No, there's is no overhead shadow, but there's. it's in the north end of the garden, and then there's a... Uh, a coach house just beyond it, so you know. So there are buildings to some extent that oh, are. Oh right! I, I think it could be quite fabulous actually, but I think you need to decide which way you want to go. And I would have thought all the exotics. So it does look like the troglodyte's cave that Matthew started. I'd add a bit of height to his ferns. I'd bring in the odd tree fern, and I think that would do brilliantly there. Um, and you probably wouldn't even need to cover them in winter, some of the hardier ones. And things like the Xantodeschia, do you know, uh, Aethopica, the cobra, that sort of thing with the white space flower. Um, they are good. I've got them in my pool, actually, in water, but they're also good in marginal areas. And I'd make, make sort of boggy bits by the pool and have things like the... There's the native iris, iris pseudocorus, but there's the variegated version of that with the white leaf, which is quite handsome and isn't so invasive as the yellow. Um, and things like gunnera, you know, give it a gunnera, big leaves. I mean, there might not be any room to get in there once you put the gunnera in, but that adds to its effect. It, uh, would, cer- it would certainly hide all the other plants that have died. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> dead plants. We don't have dead plants on the show. Um, and you could add a mirror, you know. I would add a mirror. With um, a trellis over it. Sounds corny, but he's, you know, he's done that. He's put in a mirror. And I bet it looks like it goes on into a tunnel, does it? Um, I don't go down there very often. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing fishy going on in there. <laughs> Matt? No, no, I would have uh, pots of rhododendrons, lovely terracotta pots full of things like uh, rhododendron prape. Cops. So that's a uh, small, early flowering uh, cerise purple pink it's a lovely colour I've got that one uh, in my garden uh, and a lot of the Cushimanums they're really nice and compact and they would look good with, with the ferns uh, and I would go for the hostas and go for the big leaf hostas like um, some and substance which have you know a real presence to them um, Aspidistras in pots down there because I would imagine that it doesn't get you don't get uh, heavy frosts here it might get cool in the winter, would that be okay? But you could always plant plant those again in pots or in raised beds underneath um, your tree ferns. Your so husband's going to need your help <laughs> with all this planting going on. And then, and then fatsia, fatsia japonica, with the lovely evergreen sort of hand-like uh, leaves, that would grow really well. And also in that location, if they got light, not the heavy shade, but hardy orchids, some of the uh, garden cymbidiums would grow there as well. You could put corex over part of the top in the winter and that would make it totally protected, very light and span it. And to answer your question about lights, which you didn't, yep, you could add some of those, but I don't think you'll need to. I think it would get that nice, mysterious, exotic look without lights. Mysterious, exotic. Thank you. Yes, you don't look convinced. <laughs> it's not your favourite spot in the garden, I take it. <laughs> yes, thank you. Good afternoon, panel. I'm Teresa Mitchell from Panath. I have a climbing herd hydrangea which a combination of strong winds and a competing wisteria have removed from my wall. I've tried to refix it to the wall using wire to support it. Will it anchor itself back to the wall in time or should I cut it back hard? So I, I would cut it back now. 
and I think you'll find it will go back onto the wall with gusto and keep that wisteria. You probably need to pull the wisteria back a bit, cut that back I've now done as that well. Yes. Yeah. What, so, what, what sort of wall is this? It's a stone wall. The dry stone wall with the lime mortar? It's got lime mortar, lime mortar. yes. Because yeah. I, 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 my experience with this particular plant, so I tried to grow one up a barn wall, exactly the same as your wall, with lime mortar. The plant didn't like it. It sulked, and it sulked for about eight years. Shows what a patient chap I am. <laughs> it sulked for about eight years, and then suddenly mm. took off and they stuck do, itself back to the wall. They do tend to, sometimes they go away straight away, and sometimes they sulk. Maybe you haven't quite got the green green good touch, Eric. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, I have heard that before as well. <laughs> how, how old is your hydrangea? I reckon it's about 24, 25 years old. Right, so it'll have a very well-established root system. Yes. I mean, they are, when they're in full pomp, they are absolutely splendid. And I have to say, I would be... Uh, I'd be in two minds about cutting it back because I, I, I'd be frightened of it not coming back. I mean, I think it will. I think Bunny's right. There's enough established root mm -hmm. there at that sort of age that it will come back. Um, I, I just, I've never had any luck with them. I'm, I'm obviously less green fingered even than Eric. Uh, <laughs> because every time I've tried to grow one, it never gets beyond the sulky stage. And then I, I'm afraid I, um, I get angry and uh, huh. it goes to the compost stage. Um, but um, when you say you've tried to reattach it, you've tried with wires, it hasn't, it just won't cling on or it just keeps well, falling that, off. I did that last week, so it's quite early stages. Okay. So I don't think it will go back. Having pulled away, I think its little graspers will have sort of bitten mm. the dust. The, the roots that um, that it needs to stick onto the wall actually appear on the young growth as they go up. So once it's fallen away, you won't be able to stick it back on. Okay. The other thing is, if you if you cut it hard back now, we're at the end of August. You will get a little bit of growth from it, but it's going to remain bare for the following year. So it's almost just cut, cutting it back. Um, carefully. I think what, what you want to try and do uh, is to keep as much of that main structure of the old wood as you possibly can. Obviously you'll be, then have lots of different points from which the young growth can break so it will be spreading out, fanning out all over the wall to fill in next year. So if you cut hard back, it might get a little bit of growth but we're getting towards the end of the growing season now but it's primarily to uh, get it place ready for next year and when next uh, spring comes as Matthew's already said it's got that huge root system you'll find you'll get loads and loads of growth but also helping it particularly if you get a dry spring by giving it lots of water uh, and mulch it uh, but also make, making sure that the wall itself is damp so that the little adventitious roots can adhere to the wall. And give, it, give it a good talking to. <laughs> Stand there in front of it and say, come on, do the business, prove that I've got greener fingers than that of Robson. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's take a brief break from the questions to see what's come into the GQT inbox. Uh, and first is a challenge put to the panel by somebody called Charles, who doesn't say where he's from, but I suspect California. I've got a giant redwood in my garden, he says. <laughs> I'd like the panel to advise the best way to excavate a tunnel through it so I can get my car through. <laughs> Go on then, Matt Biggs. Well, I, de I definitely wouldn't excavate a tunnel through it at all. I would actually go round it. Um, and overall, of course, you're affecting the tree, you're probably affecting its stability and its mechanical strength. Much better with a venerable tree like that to go round it. And if you lay a permeable surface around uh, so that you minimise the amount of compaction uh, over the root area, that's much better. But definitely don't even think about uh, make, turning it into a, a natural archway. It's just showing off, isn't it? It's yeah. just showing off. Look at the size of my redwood. Like. Said, yeah, and almost, I do wonder, I suppose in the days when they cut through them, it was the days when they were felling a lot of the redwoods, so they would have had... Um, but I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if they blasted their way through some of them using dynamite. And probably 90% died and the odd one survived. There we are, Charles. So if you it... don't. Anyway, we've had a few people asking whether they can still get their hands on one of the hottest tickets in town. GQT Garden Party on Saturday, 16th of September this year. 
will be pitching the tents at Ness Botanic Gardens on the Whittle for a 70th anniversary bash. It promises to be a real fun packed day. Tickets are still available. Just head to the Gardener's Question Time pages of the Radio 4 website or call the information line on 03 700 100 400. That's 03 700 100 400. We look forward to seeing you there. Questions, questions. Good afternoon, panel. My name is Helen Obi Reardon and I'm the chair of Cardiff Vale and Valley's Beekeepers Association. We're often asked about flowering plants that are good for bees. Are there any fruits or vegetables that are particularly good sources of pollen and nectar for honeybees and other pollinators? Right. What about you reckon that, Matthew Wilson? Well, certainly on the on the fruit side of things, pretty much everything that fruits is good for uh, for bees, and of course, bees are good for fruit. And uh, we we feel, uh, you know, we're, we're often asked. Oh, you know, one of my, you know, my plum tree isn't fruiting that well, or my apple tree isn't fruiting that well, and often it's directly to, related to an absence of pollinating insects, um, which can be caused by bad weather, for example, or, or a very cold spring. So, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm not going to hog all the potential plants, because that would be unfair on, uh, on my colleagues, but I will certainly say apples, crab apples actually are wonderful for bees, and you'll see them that smothered, uh, that the blossoms smothered in bees. And of course, some of our wild fruiting plants like slow, which is very early, um, that provides a, a very uh, useful early source of pollen and nectar, particularly for um, things like bumblebees, which of course can fly that much earlier than honeybees. Um, I always think it's very nice if the bees have some early food, isn't it? When they come Absolutely, out yes. on the warm sunny days in January, February, March, the almond is, um, is a great plant, that lovely pink blossom. And there's a hardy one now, well here it, you'll be pretty good anyway, and it's peach leaf curl resistant, which is robin spelt with a J and that I think is well worth growing and then obviously the, the um, plums and peaches and all those things are great and then in the you said vegetables as well yes, didn't you? yes. so things like the alliums when they go up to seed if you're not too tidy you know they just love all those flowers mm. and wild carrot that's cheating a bit because it's not really a vegetable but those flowers you always see them go for and it's just interesting to see what comes in and what they enjoy and there's an awful lot that they do if you don't have room for, uh, for for apple trees or pears, then grow them as espaliers or cordons against the fence. So even if you've only got a small garden, you can actually grow them. And uh, plants like broad beans, runner beans, uh, definitely any of your po- podding crops, uh, asparagus, peas, they're all going to depend on, on the bees. The gardener's friend, thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, next. Good afternoon. Mark Lyons from Cardiff. When we bought our house uh, over 20 years ago, we inherited a camellia. This year it's got several um, apple seed pouches on it. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not it's worthwhile trying to germinate those, and if so, how do you go about it? Have you ever tried that, Bunny? No, I haven't, but I think they're quite easy. I've heard people that have. Um, So I would try germinating it. You won't get anything like what you've got properly because it would just be a mix of something like that. But it's fun to do. You might breed the next, you know, most amazing blue camellia or something extraordinary. And although I've never done this, I'd probably put it, wait till it comes out of its case, and then I think I'll put it in some moist peat in the airing cupboard or something. Um, and then when it starts to look like it's yeah, chitting, I'm sure, I'm sorry. It into a pot. Have you ever tried it, Matt? Yeah, yeah well, no, the way I had a go at it was to, t- to take the seed out and then, then chill it over winter. With a lot of these things, they need chilling over winter to, to break the dormancy and, and in put the seeds into you a pot of moist peat substitute. Your um, it, it's somewhere question. cold. If you don't have a cold sorry. winter, then it and then uh, putting it in the uh, in, in a bag of uh, compost in the fridge for. You know, a couple of months or so, and then sow in the spring, which will be the trigger for it to germinate, and you'll get the seedlings from there. But it's more of a, like Bunny says, the chances of getting something that's really wonderful. Um, it's fairly remote, but you've got to try, and you never know. Yeah, it, it's something to play. Give it a go. go I, I always think it is. It's an interesting thing to do, is to experiment with plants from seed because it. Uh, 
it, just for the sheer fascination of it and to see whether you can actually do it or not because some plants germinate really freely um, and it's this the cu it would satisfy your horticultural curiosity to yes. do it send us photographs of your yes spectacular new plant mm. thank you very yes. much another thank question you. good afternoon i'm rick turner from panath uh, my wife helen is from god's own county yorkshire for the rest of us uh, can the panel recommend uh, plant uh, sweet and uh, here in uh, south uh, wales uh, that would make her feel at home you wanted a yorkshire garden didn't you matthew I did at Chelsea Flower Show last year. Yes, that's right. Um, well, obviously, you know, you've, you've got to have a white rose. Uh, uh, the most reliable repeat flowering white rose that I can think of is one actually that I, I used in, in that garden. And, um, ironically, it's called Winchester Cathedral. Um, <laughs> but it is—it's a really, really good repeat flowering uh, modern English shrub rose. Um, Bit of fragrance, not you know, not masses of fragrance, but decent fragrance. And I have that in my own garden, and it flowers from um, early June right the way through until the frosts. Uh, and it's just a really good, reliable, hard-working, disease-free rose. So that's your that's your starting point. What would you add, Bunny? I'd get anything of Yorkshire Fog, which is a grass you wouldn't particularly want, would you? Is it, It's nice, but it's not something she's going to drool over, to be honest. Um, she's doing the drooling over Winchester Cathedral. Yeah. The pond is about licorice, licorice, give her licorice plant, yes. Well, That's interesting, and you can eat the root. It's great, it's a laxative too, isn't it, and quite tasty. <laughs> <laughs> She'd love that. <laughs> and... Uh, I'll go for rhubarb, because the rhubarb triangle is there. Rhubarb and flat cap mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to love you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I wish, <laughs> wish you could be a, on the wall when you tell her. <laughs> I, I tell you what, Eric, if she, if she lays, seriously lays into the licorice and rhubarb, she's not going to have any time to sniff that rose. <laughs> She'll be too much, in a, too much of a hurry in the opposite direction. A Yorkshire tea, give her a tea plant. <laughs> There we are. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your question. And that, I'm afraid, is all we've time for here in Cardiff. Next week, Peter Gibbs and the panel will be taking questions from gardeners in Shetland. But until then, from me, Eric Robson, and all the team, it's goodbye and good gardening. Gardener's Question Time was produced by Hannah Newton. The assistant producer was Lawrence Bassett. It's a something else production for BBC Radio 4. Now, does this behaviour chime with you? Are you someone who constantly checks your phone or a device on your wrist to see whether you've done your 10,000 steps? If you are, you're not alone. More people than ever before are monitoring their own activity, and not just steps, but sleep quality, calories, and even moods. But when you look at the evidence, can counting every step take the enjoyment out of a good walk and even put you off it altogether? And where did the holy grail of 10,000 steps even come from? Join me, Claudia Hammond, here for Every Step You Take on BBC Radio 4 on Tuesday evening at 9 o'clock. And now it's time for Radio 4 series that proves it's surprising what you hear when you listen. Here's Fee Glover with The Listening Project. Hello. All of our conversations this week are about the things that bind us together, whether that's shared experience, similar interests, or just moments that have brought us together with another member of the human race and we've found ourselves going, oh yes, it's you, someone like me. I suspect that happened for these two friends, John and Victoria, when they started talking about films. Both of them teach at the University of Ulster. John is a lecturer in digital creative media and is currently doing a PhD in cinematic arts. And Victoria is a lecturer in that same subject. John is also a musician, he plays in a band and he has two toddlers with his partner Anna Marie. Now you may notice that Victoria has a really beautiful accent. I could listen to it all day. Although she was born in Ballymena in County Antrim, she grew up in Colerain but then spent time in New York, which explains the transatlantic lilt. All the better when discussing the memes of really terrifying horror movies. I always remember going to see Blair Witch when I was 13. Oh. And I was with my twin brother. We were at the Jet Center in Korea. And we sneaked up, and you know how you stand on your tiptoes to try and appear taller oh, bigger, right? and slightly Deep deeper voice because stuff. he was too afraid, so he, he hid behind me. 
Um, and of course we got turned away. We actually went around the back and at the time the jet centre had a really gloomy kind of alleyway around the back and you could sneak in the back door. Class, um, did you? you sneak? Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> it, was, it was excellent, yeah. And you were what, 13? Yeah, it was terrifying, but it, it was really, really good. It's weird awesome. though because you wonder why, like, what is it about that sensation of sitting in a darkened theatre with a bunch of strangers and all wanting to feel something. Yeah, 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 it's definitely. Bizarre. It's it's like that thing of just shared experience, I suppose. I, yeah, I, I well, love. The, the fear is, though, that you know that, like, your most profound thoughts or your most intimate secrets can and will be kind of portrayed on screen, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. So nothing's off limits. Aye, aye. Well, I mean, everyone makes a career out of writing relatable characters, so they're all based... All based on reality there, even the bad guys, you know. Yeah, but aren't the bad guys most interesting? Because <laughs> you're not supposed to. Society will say, ah, oh, you're not going to relate to him. Yeah. Or her. Yeah. But <laughs> That's you right, do, right. But you do, of course you do. Of course you do. You kinda, there's always a human element to it, you know. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, that's why things like slasher films are so popular, right? It's even more enjoyable in the cinema, though, isn't it? With a, you know, like people screaming and squirming or whatever around you. Yeah. you know, like the, what do you think is the scariest film you've ever seen? One of the earliest ones I remember watching is uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, actually, the early Freddy Krueger films. Of course. Yeah, the one where she's trying to get up the stairs. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, of course. And the stairs are collapsing and he's chasing after her and stuff. Yeah, Terrified anytime, me at the time. <laughs> anytime I make brilliant. pancakes, I think of that film because you know that, so the stair scene where she's running up and Freddy's running behind her with his glove That's and his right, razor blades. Yeah. The stairs are kind um, of collapsing. It's made of pancake batter. Pancake. That's how they actually filmed it. So every time I make pancakes, I think of Freddy Krueger chasing me. <laughs> it's some kind of weird metaphor, but yeah. No, <laughs> Watching over they, your they, back. They, but he's a perfect metaphor for life though because, you know, if you... If you believe that he's there, he will try to end you. That's right. But if you are, like, he's like, say he's like paranoia or he's like stress, and the yeah. more weight you give him, the more he destroys you. That's right. But yeah, if the you're more aware you fear him. and you wake up, yeah. Freddy disappears. Yeah. Right? So it that's teaches it. you something about life. I f- I f- that's right. That's a really good analogy, actually. I think more and more people are really clicking on to the fact that it's a very powerful tool to deliver a message and to change people's lives. Like Yeah, I feel like as as well, you know, if you go through life and maybe you're growing up and you all always feel like an outsider and always feel like um just an outsider or a monster, um, particularly when you're going through your teenage years and then all of a sudden there's these monsters on screen and you can kind of identify with them. You know, and so you know I think horror films in particular, they often give voice to silenced voices and marginalised voices. Yeah. Like Frankenstein Definitely. is the most marginalised monster, right? I think the ability of film and cinema to, to just connect with you visually, auditory, everything, just bring you on this emotional kind of a journey, just leaves a lasting impression. There's nothing better to teach because, you know, in a classroom of 40 young people, or, I mean, in our course, they're all, all yeah. ages, but you know in that class that... Um, you can get something that will affect everyone, you know? Yeah, that film right. is something that they're all equally passionate about and it's exciting, but it, that it can kind of help them feel like they belong yeah, in a yeah, way that other yeah. things can't because we all deeply want to belong to something that deeply wants us to belong, right? Yeah. So it can right. give us that sense of belonging. John and Victoria were recorded by Anna Quigley at BBC Radio Foil. Now, if it isn't a bonding of interest that marks out a friendship, it might be a sense of where you're from, that powerful pull of the metaphorical valley throughout your life. For Martin, you might imagine that to be a complex pull in many directions. He's a married father of five, he works for Doncaster Council as a planning ecologist, but have a listen to his heritage. It begins this part of his chat with his niece Jude. We'll come to her in a minute, but for now you do need to know that Martin was born in Scotland, but brought up mainly in South Yorkshire. He works in Doncaster and lives in Sheffield. His mum was Lithuanian Scottish and his dad was Polish. Jude's background is a little less complicated. She was born and brought up in Grimsby, but now lives in Wakefield in West Yorkshire, and she went to university in Cambridge. Last summer, she married Andy, who's Martin's nephew, and she too works at Doncaster Council as a project manager. So we join this chat about affinity, with Martin explaining his innate sense of belonging using that litmus test of sport. I haven't got a drop of British blood in my veins, Mm -hmm. but I've... I would always support Scotland, being born there. Yeah. Uh, as you know, wore the kilt for your wedding. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I would always support Scotland against England. And 
uh, but I'm a bit torn when if Scotland ever played Poland, but I can't actually recall them ever playing together. And maybe they've they've, they've avoided each other just to sort of uh, ease my mental torment. So I've uh, I've I've never had to make up my mind on that. But there's also that that thing about very strong with Yorkshire as well. Yeah, and I do feel that. Yeah, you do feel that. You know, and, and people say, oh, South Yorkshire, it's not really Yorkshire. Well, it's on the boundaries. You've got even more resolute and determined, haven't you? I think sort so. Of, uh, ma- maintain the Yorkshire spirit down here. But it's kind of growing. It's interesting. Growing up, I always used to feel quite. Um, I used to like not really like Lincolnshire, and I always used to think Yorkshire just over the water. It was oh, amazing. Right. It's like a, this uh, uh, paradise. I've always like had this image of myself in the future. I was was like, oh, I really want to live in. I wasn't very ambitious. I really want to live in, in West Yorkshire when I grow up. <laughs> and I've ended up doing that. Um, but then I've actually realised that South Yorkshire is in many ways superior. So, <laughs> Well, I wouldn't call it superior. The thing is, South Yorkshire and West Yorkshire were the same thing many years yeah, ago. So uh, let's uh, let's say there's a, you know, a small divorce and that's about it. But, you know, but Grimsby must have... I mean, you must have loved saying Grimsby when people at university asked you where you were from. Yeah, I don't know. I think, yeah, definitely. I learnt a lot at university. I think I arrived with um, at Cambridge with a bit of an inverse snobbery. Right. So I think I was like, I'm really northern, you people are all, like, stuck up and, and this kind of thing. But actually, you know, being there, you meet people from all sorts of backgrounds and there were people who were a lot more working class than I am. And there were also people who, I mean, one of my best friends ended up being from from Eton and he's just a normal guy, you know. So I think I learned through that that people from all walks of life are kind of decent. But yeah, I'm proud of being from Grimsby and there was a lot of snobbery around it. And I think it's because of the name, isn't it? People think, oh, it's Grim. So I like telling them that actually the name comes from... uh, the fact that it's a Viking town and, yeah. and Grimm was uh, was a great warrior who was given the town as, as a present from Havelock the Dane yeah. from fighting in this great and war. And anything with a BY on the end is a, is a Viking That's Viking it, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So, no, I do feel really proud of it. And I think through Cambridge, I, con- I consciously kept my accent, I like to say, GY till I die. That's my motto. Martin and Jude were recorded by our producer, Rav Sangera. If you've never taken the time or had the inclination to pop along to our website, can I highly recommend that you do? We have lots of animations up there created for us by students on some of this country's leading animation courses. They'll make you smile and it's all part of the service. Our last conversation this week fulfills our listening project remit perfectly too. All you have to do is sit down with someone you love or care about and have a conversation that matters. There's a lot that matters to old friends Janet and Michelle. They've known each other for 30 years. They met at college. Michelle has just become a doctor in the field of educational psychology and Janet is a company director. Now she's had a bad couple of years having to undergo aggressive chemotherapy for breast cancer. She is now in remission. During her treatment she had to shave off her hair and at the time she had an afro. And it's hair that she talks about here with Michelle. Both black women have plenty to say about the pressure that they felt during their lives about their hair, the way other people see it, the different ways of wearing it, and how it has at times just all been a bit too much. I can remember um, that thing where you put the cardigan on your, yeah, on your, I used to do that. <laughs> over your head and swing, you know, swing I had it from the yellow one. Yeah, and you know, used to pretend that that was. You know that that you had that long flowing hair because you always wanted that long flowing hair. I borrow force at majors. And you know, the image of beauty just isn't us. Well, no. Was it? It definitely wasn't me. No, it definitely wasn't me. One one of the motivating factors for me going natural was I, I was um, when I was at university in Leicester. Um, I did a, a after school club with a for. for black kids and I was walking home with this little girl and she was she was so excited Jan she was so excited oh I, I can't wait I'm, I, I'm gonna get my hair done I'm gonna get my hair done and I thought oh she's getting it plaited up she's you know getting a nice style I said what do you mean she's gonna you know get in your head what's, what's gonna happen it's gonna be just like that just gonna... and she pointed over to this white lady who was walking in front of us and I I and I had my my hair was straightened at the time and I just felt well she can't look at me and see, well, that's a different 
way of being or, or actually having my natural hair is it's as good as anything else. You know, her excitement was about her hair that was just about to get straightened. And I, and I thought to myself, I, you know, I have to be a role model, whether it's for, you know, any little girl that comes into contact with me needs to be able to... needs to be able to look at me and feel pride and feel pretty. And feel it was really funny because when I sat in the doctor's waiting area, I was on my own, because I didn't think anything was going to tell me anything bad. And I had this brilliant ha- afro going on that day. Mm. Michelle, you would have been so proud. It was massive. <laughs> and I felt so comfortable with my huge, massive afro. in a way that I've never done before. And when it was...
No. I have six percent. Thank you. Have a good. Have a good. Have a good. Have good to drive. Bye, mate.
kunnen we even via externe, cont externe contacten doen, dan kun je hem vinden.